but I think Uzma's involvement uh, with with this in a kind of through a critical lens and through her own practice comes with her interest in decolonizing archaeology, ancient urbanism, critical heritage studies, new materialism, and post-colonial critique. Ozma's presentation is titled On the Sound of Salt. Um, and thank you for being here, Ozma. Thank you so much for that invitation, for the invitation to speak and also for that introduction. Um, it's a particular honor. I know it's a small group, but I'm still going to read. Otherwise, I'll speak to you for like two hours. So I'm just going to try to keep it um, like contained. Um, but it is a particular honor to be able to be part of the closing program for a slightly curving place. It's an ex exhibition, but more importantly, um, it's a generative, discursive, and thought-provoking place to inhabit. And so I wanted to not only to thank the team here at Al Circal, Nada, Diane, Atija, who have done everything and make it look so effortless, but I know it takes a lot of work, so thank you. Um, but I also want to in thank Nida and Brooke, who have created the space for engagement and are constantly asking us over the past two years to think deeper and differently about the materials we study. And I know neither of them are here in this moment, but I certainly feel them in spirit. So I just want to thank them out there in spirit. Um, no, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Huh. If I make a funny face, I'll take it down so you can see the face I'm making. Otherwise, I think you can just imagine. Um, generally, I'm smiling, so you can just imagine me smiling as I speak. So to start with, I think it's important to state that I'm not an acoustic archaeologist per se. I'm an archaeologist who deals with the senses and an intimacy of engagement with the ancient world through the contemporary moment. Within an archaeology of sound, there are some particular modes of inquiry, such as the desire to reconstruct what the ancient soundscape might be, or work done on capturing the sound of the ruin, thus hearing something we may never realize we are listening to when we visit these spaces. Each of these modes have specific relevance within an understanding of the past. For example, and I'm going to show you two videos. So last week I was in Mohenjo-daro which is this, the site I'm going to take you through. Um, last week, one of my students, Gul Kalash, used her phone and was documenting the site. And I'll, I'll press play in a second. And she sent me these through WhatsApp, right? So the resolution's not amazing. But, but I think for what we're trying to understand, I think this is quite good. I couldn't help but be struck by the acoustic material that was full in this, in this work. It allows us to imagine a reconstruction of life in this ancient city. Let's see if I can make this video work. A short one. That's me plodding along. So here we are walking through the city of Mohenjo-daro, and I was struck not just by the sound of the birds, which was remarkable even when we were there, but also the echo at the end when I said ready, right, if you heard that. Um, and I think as I'm standing there on the top of the late period door sill, at different points in, in, in the space, you can hear different kinds of echoes or reverberations. But when you're actually in the room, there is no, it's actually very well insulated so you don't hear echo at all, right? And so it's kind of interesting the different kinds of spaces. So I think it's important to kind of think about the extent walls, the way the sound is documented and it keeps shifting. And again, this is relevant based on whatever sort of research one might be invested in, right? So these sorts of questions depend on the kinds of research that you're doing. In this second short video, again done by a cell phone, uh, I can get to the next video. It's a very short one. This is also in Mohenjo-daro. You can see us walking out, off the site. But here, what's interesting is that you're able to experience an ancient possibility through a phenomenological perspective, right? One in which sound and space come together to provide a sense of what it might have been like. 
and it provides opportunity to think through a phenomenological gaze to consider implications related to Dissertot's strategies or tactics in terms of how one walks through a city. As significant as these forms of reconstruction are, my own work has considered the act of listening or of acoustics as an explicit form of communication in which human non-human relations are negotiated. For me, listening to the archeological site has more to do with the recognition of materials that make up the city, both again, human and non-human. The ways by which materiality itself communicates and makes us act in very particular ways. It is through such a lens that a political reading is actually possible. It is this particular manner, in this particular manner, that Salt emerges as a public figure, as someone to be reckoned with, engaging with us in a manner that has the capacity to break the colonial seal of an ancient site. These contours of entanglement are conceived through an overarching interrogation of what I call the politics of things, in which our protagonist, Saul Mirabalis, grants us the capacity to move through various scales of engagement from a consideration of the relationship of salt to the sand, which leads to the bricks and the walls of the third millennium BCE city of Mohenjo-daro. This connected to the manner by which the colonial project is established in an ancient city as a site, and in doing so, seals it, right? As one might a collection or a corpus of materials that now exist in a different context from their archeological past. This colonial ceiling, I argue, is maintained by UNESCO in a post-1947 world. The use of the site as a thing unto itself has an ontological impact as it now exists within a new set of relations that are internal and peculiar to the site as a collection. And here I'm expanding on early work on collection as a way of being done by Andrew Motu. So it's within such a matrix that the story of Mohenjo-daro moves between discourses related to the impact of salt and sacrifice of mud to a history of discovery by men of the long century, by those who within a colonial framework conduct archeological field study as military campaigns. And as part of those campaigns, construct and define the site as an archeological site. These campaigns are embedded within systems of governance, specifically colonial governance, and those engaged in that system replicate the impact of that system merely by participating in it. Heralding tenants of modernity, the Archaeological Survey of India, or the ASI, at the time of discovery of the site, was the quintessential colonial bureaucratic machine, as well demonstrated by Ashish Chadra's work on this. In looking through archival material, and we'll look through some of it together, it's always heartening to find those officers who play the system, much to the chagrin of the colonial senior officers. And one such officer was the superintendent of the Western Circle of the Archaeological Survey of India, Rakhaldas Banerjee. Let me see if I can get us to him. Rakhaldas Banerjee first reported the site in 1919 and began a small scale excavation in 1922. This year is the 100 year, it marks the 100 year centennial celebrations. Nainjot Lahari, in her remarkable book, Finding Forgotten Cities How the Indus Civilization Was Discovered, details much of Banerjee, Banerjee's career and tense relationship with senior officers, most notably with the Director General, John Marshall. For a variety of reasons, Banerjee was unable to conduct large-scale excavations and was continuously transferred within the ASI until he voluntarily retired in 1926. Large-scale excavations then took place subsequently under the direction of Sir John Marshall, who you see here, and Rao Bahadur K. N. Dixit, who you see here. He's the one in the center right there with the pith hat. Um, 1924 is when these large-scale excavations began, and it was quite a year for Mohenjo-daro. In addition to Kane Dixit, who also served as Director General of the ASI between 1937 and 1944, Bandit M.S. Vats was also part of the excavation, and he too later served as Director General of ASI. But this time period between 1919 and 1924, a time right after World War I, when budgets from the Metropole were still tight, excavations were difficult to fund and low on the list of priorities. Although not cited as incentive, one of the key ways to get money for these campaigns were, was through a new form of publicity, particularly spectacular headlines. This was something that archeologists such as Leonard Woolley figured out in his work at Ur, his archives at the University of Pennsylvania, indicate that he knew the power of the newspaper, but not just any newspaper, very importantly, the illustrated London News. 
It was one of the earliest graphic magazines of its time and it had a huge readership. He was media savvy and the Illustrated London News ran no less than 30 articles about Ur. Ur is in Mesopotamia. Willie understood that the public articulation of this generation was not just oral and textual, but the visual field allowed for an imagination informed, dictated, and created by the images provided by archaeologists, right? And this is, again, coming to the colonial ceiling of Mohenjo-daro, right? So it's unclear if Woolley and Marshall were in contact with one another about this particular strategy, but certainly Woolley's success in gaining recognition and funds to continue excavations were well known. And so by 1924, Mohenjo-daro was announced and made public in the Illustrated London News. For Marshall, it was the seeing of the ancient city and the remains that were important. The public articulation of the site had to be visual. We know from his letters and internal memoranda that he was delighted with the public response to the coverage and remarked upon how fortunate they were that the images of the seals allowed other archaeologists to write to him with information regarding other sites that were of the same antiquity. And in fact, within a week, we have Professor Sais providing, here we go, providing um, stylistic evidence from other sites in the Near East and proposed the dates of the seals to be of the third millennium BCE. The formation of these new publics who actively and passively began to consume these finds through mass media transformed archeological sites into the spectacle. These were English reading publics that through such media campaigns began to claim a stake in the universality of heritage. And indeed that was precisely the point. In looking for that patronage, the archeology span of the colonies becomes British. How else would these projects get funded unless the British public dem demonstrated an interest and a desire for and in the history of the colonies? And ultimately they did, with the ASI carrying out some of its more significant excavations by Ernest McKay, who excavated the site between 1926 and 1931 under the supervision of both Marshall and later Harold Hargraves. The last excavation took place in the 1960s with a focus then on salvage conservation. And I'll talk more about that in a second. The same public that was rooting for excavations and research now converted its interest to stopping research and excavation. In fact, although archaeologists continue to advise UNESCO to allow for ongoing research in order to understand the ancient city, UNESCO instead allocates large sums of money to figure out how to reroute water. And all of this due to the overwhelming and loud presence of salt. Now, just to give you some sense of the site itself. The site of Mohenjo-daro is circled in red. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can see it there. And it's considered one of the main urban centers in the Indus civilization, extending well over 250 hectares. This map documents some of the major sites that are considered to be part of the larger Indus culture. The archeological site is located in a semi-arid region of Sindh, situated on a Pleistocene ridge uh, and sits like an island in the floodplain of the Indus River. Although this ridge is now deeply buried by annual flooding, most archeologists agree that the city was probably more prominent in the third millennium BCE, standing out above the surrounding plains. Moreover, the site is located in a very central position between two vast river valleys, the Indus to the west, seen in this image on the lower right, and the Ghagra Hakra to the east. The farming in the surrounding area is primarily conducted through an extensive network of canals, and this was true in antiquity as well. Let me move you through the site a little faster. Archaeological excavations at Mohenjo-daro document hundreds of dwelling houses and large buildings constructed along streets and lanes oriented towards cardinal points, which index an architectural sophistication of a well-planned city. Early research on the site recognized it as part of the third millennium BCE. With subsequent excavations over the next 40 years, uncovering the densely built urban area, the last major excavation was carried out by George Dales in 1964-65, after which excavations were banned due to the problem of conserving the exposed structures from weathering and the rising water table. It was in 1963 that the government of Pakistan asked UNESCO to send a mission of experts to study the condition of the city of Mohenjo-daro. And by, 19, by January 1964, Harold Lenderleith, from the UK and the director for the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property in Rome, was joined by two experts from the Netherlands 
Theodore Beaufort, an engineer, and Caesar Vogt, a geologist. And according to the report filed by Netico on the desalination of Mohenjo-daro in 1966 and 67, one of the key things to do was to lower the water table, and that they claimed was possible by a three-pronged drainage system. This prompted the formation of UNESCO's International Safeguarding Campaign for Mohenjo-daro, and which was created in order to raise money to protect and conserve the site from the rising water levels of the Indus. Also known as the Save Mohenjo-daro Campaign, this initiative ran from 1974 to 1997, raising over 8 million US dollars from member states to combat, and I hear I quote, saline action, right, the action of salt, on the foundations and the structures of this ancient city. As per UNESCO reports, the safeguarding campaign comprised of groundwater control through the installation of tube wells, river training, conservation of structural remains, landscaping, and plantation. The main project at Mohenjo-daro since 1979 has been an archi ar architectural documentation and investigation of formal and functional aspects. So also important to note that by uh, 19, uh, 1979, Mohenjo-daro was on number 138 on the World Heritage List, and it was inscribed in 1980 under criteria two and three. So once you become a World Heritage Site, there's a very particular way in which um, people are allowed or not allowed onto the site, right? Things can happen or not happen. So visually arresting, uh, due to its elevation, the Western Mound, let's see, here's, here's our um, Ikemos, here's the archive for than the justifications for the World Heritage Site. So you can see here that area that I've, I've circled um, is, has been called the Stupa Mound, the Citadel, the Acropolis, the Mound of the Great Bath. And it's separated by the lower town through, um, through a certain amount of space. But you kind of, you go up and then you go down and then you go up again. And so one of the things that you um, encounter is the sense of the city being on many different mounds. Those were actually constructed in antiquity, specifically to guard the um, site from the flooding of the Indus, right? So it's an important aspect of all of this. So this necessarily quick overview of the site exemplifies the approach to archeology span of South Asia. And particularly at the site of Mohenjo-daro as active project or excavations have not been permitted since the mid 60s. And so by virtue of epistemic continuity and an insistence of a particular form of scientific rigor that focuses solely on the object, contemporary scholarship replicates certain colonial ways of knowing and being. The representations of the site continue to be top down. The reports are descriptive, but only in passive voice. And the intimacy with which we experience these sites is unspoken, perhaps because the vocabulary does not yet exist. Here, when I speak of intimacy, it is not to be confused with love or affection. I mean, I do love and like the city quite a bit, but that's not actually what I'm talking about. It's to think about intimacy to be utilized as a noun, which has to do with an innermost familiarity, a commingling, a deep association. If the episteme does not contain the vocabulary of intimacy, it suggests that it does not exist in the world of meaning making within the archaeology of South Asia. So this sort, this kind of colonial archaeology has been categorized by the colonial project that secularized science in the name of progress, thus creating a confounding issue within which science, when utilized without a critical lens, becomes reiterative of a new colonial present. This desire for good science is reiterated throughout the archaeological heritage discourse as well, particularly when dealing with issues of conservation and preservation. It is maintained through the framework of UNESCO and discourses around authenticity and outstanding universal value, integrity, protection and management requirements. This complex web of situated histories of colonialisms, UNESCO's involvement, the project of nation building in the post-colony, the trauma of independence, the impact on, on minority populations, and a continued rise of fascist doctrines across this region, masking themselves within religious rhetoric are conditions that require a different kind of archeology, span one that does not write about the world, but rather writes in the world. It requires an archeology span that recognizes a simultaneity to time, where in one moment, this archeological site occupies multiple registers of contingent semiotic value, 
an analysis that has the capacity to move through time more openly and is willing to contend with the messiness that that engenders, leading and enabling a nuanced and situated archeological praxis. And so it's in such a context that listening to materials, thinking and engaging with materials in an intimate manner allows for a different engagement. So as you know, last week, I was, I was walking through DKG. The video that you saw was me walking through DKG um, area, which is an excavated neighborhood in the lower town of the third millennium BC site. It was a beautiful, crisp, clear morning, blue skies, no cloud in sight. I felt like I was walking on air because in fact, I was. I looked back at my footsteps, intermingled with all those others, and I realized that there was something significant to the depth of the marking on the surface. Each footprint left a mark of nearly four centimeters or more. Usually when walking on an archeological site, the imprint is no more than two centimeters, barely, if that. And there's clear contact with solid ground quite immediately. Unlike walking through sand or soil, which both have a certain drag and pull to them, walking through Mohenjo-daro felt effortless, almost buoyant, and kind of crunchy. It sounded like I was walking on leaves, but it looked like snow. Not wanting to be bound by the tyranny of the visual field, I bent down, I licked my index finger, and I touched the surface. Everything that you see here that's white is all salt. All right, that is the salt. I picked up this, um, some of the, the pieces from the surface, grains and crystals, and I tasted it. It was light, mellow, and salty which is actually quite distinct from the earthiness of umami, right? It didn't taste like sand, it didn't taste like dirt. The light and airy salt content dominated the initial taste, but the aftertaste was where the mellowness and the sandiness really came in. It tasted like a crystal web of salt in the shape of a granule that no longer existed. But rather the crystalline structure was propped up by smaller pieces of very fine sand. But this salt tasted milder than our common NACL table salt or sodium chloride that it tasted more like sodium sulfate in case anyone's tasted different kinds of salts. This simple inorganic compound Na2SO4 was initially named sol mirabilis or miraculous salt due to its laxative ability by Dutch German chemist Johan Glauber in 1625. Reliably and easily soluble in water, sodium sulfate is an enabler, right? a translator, a fixer, a communicator, a mineral that allows for smooth passage. Chemists consider this mineral inoffensive and easy, but it also seems to have a high capacity to resist. Sodium sulfate takes a high amount of energy to change from solid to liquid and goes through a second phase change at about 32 degrees Celsius when it changes into an anhydrous form, which means that it can store considerably more heat energy than would be expected for any particular mass. This is the key to understand what's happening at Mohenjo-daro. An analysis of the bricks illustrates that sodium sulfate was already present in the bricks during the ancient occupation of the site. And so as the heat of the sun continues for 5,000 years on the bricks of this ancient city, they themselves maintain the heat through the mineral. Sol mirabilis is constitutive of the brick itself. As noted in the 8788 report by the Authority of Preservation of Mohenjo-daro, Excavated brick structures at Mohenjo-daro are deteriorating at an unacceptable high rate because of the crystallization and hydration of the mineral thenardite, sodium sulfate. Let me just show you a photo of thenardite. This is through an electron scan microscope, so it's, it's, it's quite a small resolution there. Its destructive effect is mainly attributed to a volume increase of 315%, resulting when the thenardite hydrates to form mirabilite. Subfluorescence of soluble salts is much more destructive than efflorescence. So this transforms the story of our otherwise inoffensive mineral to one of slow violence and a destruction that is embedded within the materiality of the brick itself. The publicness of efflorescence just scratches the surface of what seems to be a laxative engagement within the brick. It is the publicness of this action, this efflorescence that's seen on the surface of the bricks that prompted that appeal by the Pakistani government in 74, leading to UNESCO's safeguarding campaign that I mentioned earlier. Although Mohenjo-daro is protected by the national and regional laws, including the Antiquities Act of 1975, from threats of damage and pillage, those laws do little to stop the saline action. But what seems to be working is an application of mud slurry and mud capping. 
As you see here in this image, the aim is to provide an application of mud slurry to the entire wall, in particular the bases of the wall. So as, the, as what the conservation scholar Enrico Fod has explained, it provides an extra sacrificial protection where the salt attacked is higher. So again, just thinking about the vocabulary that's being used here. Okay? And this image comes from his publication. It's important to keep in mind, these are obviously not the only measures being taken, but it's most clearly visible when you're at the site. So mud slurring has been hailed by UNESCO as a, quote, holistic approach that forms a sacrificial layer in which de deterioration can take place. The articulation and reiteration of a public sacrifice in multiple disciplines indexes a particular form of narrative around the site of Mohenjo-daro. In this narrative, both sacrificial mud, sand, clay, and brick are being saved by the sacrifice that comes from the same matrix. In bringing this up, I'm not interested in anthropomorphizing NA2SO4, right? That's not the point. But rather, I'm curious how we as critical scientists might consider this ability to resist, to not change. Resistance is an interesting concept because it's not relegated to human beings. Resistance can be thought of in physics as friction, electrical resistance, geological resistance, thermal resistance, etc. So is it possible that these resistant salts, constitutive of the bricks that make up this site, are resisting through acts of immolation? It's one of the many questions that, that emerges from such work. So once we sh shift our focus away from the colonial narrative, of what the site is and listen to the site itself. There's a different negotiation that we hear between the salt and the mud. There's a different approach to the site that we might inhabit. One that allows us to free ourselves of the colonial narratives and instead consider what life might have been like 6,000 years ago through the communication and intimacy between, between those living human and non-human in Mohenjo-daro. Thank you. So our second speaker today is Sukanto Majumdar, who is um, visiting us from Calcutta. Welcome. Um, he is a sound artist and audiographer specialized in field recording and sound designs for film and for theater. Um, and he has worked on, on many film projects. Um, he's also the co-creator of The Traveling Archive with Moshami Bhomik, which has existed since 2003 and is a really integral part of the exhibition. Um, and they have been field recording, documenting, and dis uh, disseminating the folk music of Bengal. Um, he works with ambient sound and with spoken word, has worked on art installations as well, um, and is interested in the sounds of both religious and non-religious ritual. Um, and today he's talking um, or expanding on a text uh, that he wrote for the publication, A Slightly Curving Place. We have some copies here. We have many more copies arriving. So if you're interested in getting a copy, let us know. Um, they're also available online with archive books. But his text um, is, is called Ways of Listening and uh, engages with how we listen to spaces and places, not just archeological sites, but also to the everyday. Um, and he's gonna talk to us about different ways of listening and relating to the world, um, which links in, I guess, with the workshops that we've been doing um, last week with the Ashas and also with the Archaeology of Sound Study Group. So, pleasure to have you here. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge, uh, huge pleasure really and also an honor to be able to come over here after uh, 2020, that nightmare time. And uh, um, because uh, as Nada already said that um, I was part of uh, the project from the beginning, like um, when Nida spoke to me first time, um, I remember everything was uh, um, so in, in our mind, everything was somewhere in the space and we constantly tried to think that together, that how, how, how we are going to put it together and whatever concepts, whatever fragments of thoughts we had, uh, how are we going to join? So, and, and a huge thanks actually goes to Nida really because 
she constantly pushed me because i i i really come from mostly from a film film background so i constantly work for films mixes stuff uh, and then uh, she really pushed hard that okay you have to think and then talk and uh, so we did that field trip that was uh, uh, really nice in the beginning of 2020 and i think in february if i remember correctly and uh, i wish we were all here that <laughs> because yeah that 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 time was really good. Alex, Alex, me, Tyler, uh, Nida, Huma. Um, it was a really, really great time. We spent recording in Anupu and in um, Sita Benga and Jogi Mara Caves. <coughs> um, so it started all there in that time. And uh, then this thing broke out, uh, COVID thing, and we had to constantly talk over phone and like think how to do it together. And we didn't know even the exhibition is going to happen or not. But finally it did. And so this is why I thought maybe why not just, um, because from that moment we, we all actually started thinking about this listening and listening to spaces and how we listen to spaces and why we listen to spaces. Why do we need to listen to spaces at all? Uh, including ancient archaeological spaces and also the spaces that we inhabit. Uh, uh, so uh, this is what, this is why I thought this maybe I just talk about that a little bit uh, today because it's a nice opportunity to, um, uh, yeah, just talk about our our, our thoughts and uh, to because this is the end uh, of this exhibition. Today is the end of the end of this exhibition. So, uh, let's start with archaeological spaces. Like what, I mean, what happens when we, when we listen to archaeological spaces? I mean, what does it mean to listen to an archaeological spaces? Now, one side is obviously, one side is that, that Uma has already been doing, that you, map the space sonically and and try to understand the acoustics of the space and um, you have you collect data you come back to 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 the studio or you know any any to to any software and then feed the data and kind of recreate uh, and that space uh, that is definitely one way of listening to it uh, but what are these archaeological spaces, if we think, particularly the spaces that we worked with, uh, Sita Benga, Jogi Mara, and Anupu. Uh, they're all spaces of rituals, ceremonies, performances. And so with the, these kind of spaces, we have certain kind of engagement. And I think that is one important thing to think about when you talk about listening to these kind of spaces because that's, that engagement makes it, I think, a uh, little different from the way now we listen to spaces. Uh, and listening, if you think about it, listening has always been a very cultural process. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, uh, and in the ancient time, the kind of engagement that we had with sound, if we think, if we try to think about it, it's it's quite different from now, because um, we are we are modern people with some scientific knowledge about it. I mean, we understand sound also through science, the physical uh, physical reasons that why why the reflections happens, why reverb happens, why echo happens. Everything is kind of clear to us right now, so. That, that, that mystery is kind of resolved. And, uh, uh, but if we think about the people that, who were encountering thousands and thousands of years back those spaces, 
what was it to them? I mean, people who had no scientific knowledge and no uh, understanding of physical properties of sound. So it's a different kind of engagement. Think up, think about someone who is entering in the cave that time. And the spa space immediately started speaking to them, right? I mean, you walk, the space responds. You talk, the space responds. You do whatever physical activity, the space responds. So the space has become kind of a living being, like someone you can talk to, someone you can uh, relate to in a way that we don't relate to anymore. On the, on the, uh, actually, on the contrary, on the other hand, we don't want reverberation anymore in our life. I mean, look at the studios, like look at the space that we put up, put up the exhibition. We tried hard to minimize the reflections. So reflections are abundant. And back then, reflections were an integral part of life. And that added some kind of, and that added to the concept of, you know, life, that how you, how you connect with the world. Uh, so, so those, those things are all gone. We are, we are, we are someone, uh, we are, we are uh, people that, 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 we don't listen to sound anymore. I mean, if you if you if you think uh, about these spaces, that when we talk about okay, these spaces has gone through a lot of changes. Uh, maybe um, like when we are trying to create something, uh, uh, like taking the data measurement, um, and uh, I'm talking about acoustical measurement and stuff, and then went back. I mean, going back to the studio, trying to create the space. If, if is it accurate or not, there are debates about it. But the point is that the spaces may have gone through a lot of changes, no doubt about it. But we changed, I think, quite a lot. Maybe if we, if we think about, uh, like, like let's, say, let's say, let's take an example of, of some sounds, then we understand it better, I think. Uh, if we, Let's say sound of bells. Like we can still have bells that that you know that made with the same same material, same uh, same size, same kind of structure, and that that comes from thousands and thousands of thousand year back, and that bell can make certain kind of sound, and we can we can hear it like people heard it before. People have heard it before. But is it the same connection? It is not anymore. Because the bells were, had some kind of different meaning to us when we were like in that time. And that meaning has something to do with also here something to I think understand that there was a, that life was, a, it was a communal life. It was a, it was a kind of life that there was, there was no privacy in it. So when, when the sound of bells come to the community, the community reacts to it. It's, it's a reaction of, the, of, of and it, the feeling is communal, what I'm trying to say here. And that, that mode of listening has completely gone. Uh, the way we react to it, it's nowadays bell, bell it's, it's more meaning, it's more, symbolic to us symbolic in the sense that it uh, it carries a kind of meaning that okay two bells means it's one class is over or three bells means it's tiffin time or maybe you know something else even even uh, so it's it, it the, the the idea of listening idea of listening to sounds has has gone through a lot of changes and this is one thing i think we should consider when we are trying to talk about spaces and listening to spaces, even listening to archaeological spaces. Uh, that is what I thought um, in the beginning. And uh, also, uh, if you look at sound itself, how and what sound is nowadays to us? Uh, 
I think it's, uh, I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's mostly entertainment, uh, it's information, or it's noise, basically. Like, like John Cage once, say, once said, no, that the new silence is traffic. So, <laughs> so yeah. So it's, it's, so this is, this is sound is for us today. I mean, if you think about it. Uh, and that makes quite a lot of difference. Number one, it may sound basically a commodity, a something to sell, something to, uh, because, uh, and, and that, that character that, that, that you, you, you have sound now that, that you can sell, that also uh, created the possibility that if you buy something, obviously you want to enjoy it privately. And that created the possibility of listening it in a very private spaces, listening to it in a very private spaces. And that has direct connection with sound recording and the history of sound recording and, you know, the way the technology developed, recording technology, listening technology, whatever you call it. Uh, so this has basically created a lot of private spaces for us. And if you think about private spaces and listening sound in a private spaces, what is happening actually? Uh, now, when we hear something, not in a private space, I'm talking about just hearing something in general, you are not only hearing it, your other senses also are also working. It's not only your ears, it's also other senses that your eyes, touch, whatever. Think about, think about, um, let's say, let's say, think about something like an event like an like like rhythm let's say rhythm is something that you can actually listen you can actually touch you can actually see so it's it's uh, I'll, I'll come to this this point a little late but what i'm trying to say is in a private space uh, what happens is and the way that, that the way we want to sound uh, hear sound right now what happens is it's it just separate your senses in a, in a way. I mean, a very common example is, let's say we all do it. We put a headphone in our ear when you're traveling on a metro or a train or a bus some, or somewhere and just listen to our favorite sounds, whatever we want to listen to. And that separate our senses from the rest of the world. And it just, if you, if you see Another train passing, you just see it, but don't listen to it. If you, you see the people talking, but you don't actually listen to it, you just see it. So it's a, it's, it just separate your senses. And, uh, and that's how we enjoy sound nowadays. So it's not a, a very communal engagement anymore, uh, in a sense. But now let's, let's, uh, think about a little bit more about the like the modes of listening because and this is I'm taking uh, the this idea is already given by uh, someone a French composer and uh, philosopher and film theorist Michel Chion so what he says and he's he actually someone he writes he writes on cinema in, and film sound but this thing which I'm going to talk about right now, I think it goes very well with our daily life. It's, it's just not about um, you know, films. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not only, I mean, it is associate, associated with uh, film watching thing, but I think we can apply it into our daily life listening things. So he says a very interesting thing. He says that, see, we listen to things in three different ways. One he called, the first one he's called casual listening. Now casual listening, <laughs> listening is what? That 
that is we do every day like it it comes from uh, i mean the kind of listening that that we do with all our experience with our memory and we associate this listening with our memory with our with our you know with our experience with our cultural baggage whatever we have and we listen to it that way and this is like i i give you an example that that makes it very clear i think uh, let's say when you when you listen to a to a film is a very good ex- actually way to understand it let's say when you are watching a uh, uh, battle sequence on on a movie and it's a medieval battle sequence let's say any sound of metal clinging will feel like two swords are banging together it will it's like that so it's something that you always want to hear and this is what this is how we listen to it we want to hear something and that is that is why we hear about it uh, and hear it i mean uh, another very good example is like in a in a crowd a lot of people are talking and uh, if you want to listen someone in that you can actually listen and uh, that is that has something to do with psychoacoustics what they call it um, it has some connection with that but this is one way of listening that is that we do every every day and all of us do it and another way of listening also we all of us do it it's he calls it semantic listening so symbolic so sound becomes a symbol like a lot of a very good example is language when we listen to language it's not the sound it's basically the meaning of it and uh, the language we know and music another very good example that we we um, we listen to music and we basically understand it's uh, uh, you know it's rhythm it's harmonics it's 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 tune uh, all sorts of thing so um and semantic listening nowadays for us has gone too far that we even now daily life we deal with what they call ear cons Uh, uh like icons they made you know in computer science they did it like like the shutting down of the computer is an universal symbolic sound and we we don't we, we don't hear it as 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 sound it's just that that symbol that we hear the opening of uh, i mean opening up of windows closing down of windows pressing a file all sorts of stuff. so they are not sound anymore they are just symbols to us uh, so this is one thing another and another thing is very interesting he called it reduced listening and reduced listening is something he says that that needs some kind of practice because then you basically peel off all this symbolism whatever baggage from sound and listen to it as sound now these these obviously need some kind of practice and that is what we professionals do every day like it's a very common uh, thing to say in the studio in a sound studio that when we are working let's say with voices that can you make it a little sharp or can you make it a little dull so it's 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 not voice anymore to us it's just that sound the quality the acoustic quality of it and that can go very far and uh, that he says reduce listening now so this <sighs> these all these kind of listenings are actually though he is talking about film sound and he says it in in the light of film sound if you say but i think it goes very well also in our daily life and the way we listen to it and these applies to also listen to spaces hmm. because like now spaces also now come back to let's come back to spaces because spaces also has changed uh, in, in our life uh, quite a lot we we talked about we started with archaeological spaces and like also the spaces the kind of spaces that we inhabit uh, but then you also have virtual spaces nowadays and uh, and that's becoming quite uh, quite a, quite a thing like quite a quite a place to uh, think about and uh, how how we are going to deal sonically to these spaces Uh, uh and if we think about whatever virtual space that we we have encountered till now like let's say gaming spaces or 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 or, or, 
or a chatting spaces or something like that. They are always, I mean, full of basically, if you think about it carefully, they're full of mostly about semantic, semantic listening that, that you hear for codes, you look for codes, you hear codes only there, uh, the meaning, the symbol and not only any other sounds anymore and that also separate your senses from the rest of the world quite a, uh, I mean that that listening actually enforce I think in a way that you separate your senses from the rest of the world uh, so these are all all I think uh, uh, new spaces that we 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 have not much idea till now that how we are going to encounter sonically. I mean, because that 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 whole if we have something, uh, I mean, if we we all all live in a sonic world, right? But in in that kind of spaces, that sonic world is kind of defined, in a sense, uh, kind of given to you. Uh, so these are the spaces that that where where. Uh, where we we, do, we don't know that how we are actually going to listen to other things and other nuances of life and stuff and uh, so from that point I think I I uh, yeah so these these uh, questions leads us to think or forced us in a way to think that uh, how we are going to listen to our own spaces where we inhabit uh, where we where we live every day encounter every day all this mundanity that we live with live through how we are going to encounter that sonically and this is needed because this gives us a completely different understanding of the world and why I'm saying it I come to this point because I'll just uh, talk about a way of listening now that I'm part of and it's an interesting uh, uh, project that uh, we do as um, as as uh, yeah, uh, I mean it's it's a it's a uh, group of artists that's do worldwide this project, and this is uh, we call this is based on streaming sound. Okay, so sound that basically getting streamed for a long time, over the time, or sometime also for short time, it depends, but uh, and depends on 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 what we want to do. But this is something that we, we really, uh, uh, I really think it gives a, it's a, gives a very different idea, very different notion about spaces. Uh, so what we do is, I show you a small map here. Just give me one moment. Yes. So this is our map that, uh, so it's basically created really uh, with a lot of artists together and we work worldwide together to maintain these and kind of contribute to this. Uh, so these are all, so it's a, it's a, uh, these are all, um, these things are all basically uh, microphones uh, that is active right now. And uh, people do it from all sorts of places, all sorts of places, and they leave. They mostly the kind of places they leave every day, and they stream sound from here. And what kind of sound? It's the sound that we we live with. And um, and why I'm saying it is interesting because I I just give you a, a small thing to think about. Uh, because I do it with sometimes with also students and 
it's interesting that if I ask you, let's say, uh, that you think, uh, you tell me your, describe, let's say, let's, let's describe your room, if I ask you. I think you'll do it quite quickly, like there is a window this side and one, you know, there's a yellow color of co color carton or maybe the bed sheet is, is this color. You know it very well. Even you can, you can walk through it, closing your eyes. You know it very well. You inhabit, you live there. But if I ask you, can you just explain it sonically to me? That how it listens, how your room sounds. I think it, it's not a tricky question. You can, I'm sure that you will be able to tell tell us, but it will take a little bit of time for sure. It's not as easy as the way you can describe it uh, visually. So it's nothing. It's it happens because the world is overwhelmingly overwhelmingly visual because it's it is it just takes over. So, but the thing is, if you just carefully listen then that gives a lot of understanding of spaces and places. Not only that, that uh, the way that, uh, you know, that understanding, cultural understanding obviously, and acoustical understanding and all, but also maybe an understanding about the future. That how, what kind of spaces we are going to be in future or live in and want to live in. Uh, particularly, it's a, it's a time of climate crisis and stuff, so it, it gives a lot of views, uh, insights. Uh, so these are the places where um, we all, our friends or, or everywhere in the world somewhere, they do <laughs> this trimming from their back garden, from someone from their parents' house, someone like I do it from my uh, office space on the top of... Um, just, just a moment. Take that off because then it shows you. Yeah, so. And this gives why I'm showing it because when I started it, I just want to share my experience and then I'll end my talk over here. Um, wh when I started it, with these people, I really thought that, okay, I am a, you know, I, I basically <laughs> sell my ability to listen to, right? And that's how I live. And so I'm a good listener, maybe. But <laughs> then, then this comes and then uh, we thought that, okay, we do it from our own spaces. And I thought, well, my own space, I know it very well. And, um, all sorts of sounds I know, I record. And then I started listening to my own space. And it gives such an interesting thing. And you, what happens is you constantly actually discover unknowns into that known sphere. And unknowns in terms of, I mean, in, in many ways, like, like the, uh, I, I give you the example of my place where I live in Kolkata. It's a place of, place where a lot of uh, people actually came and started living after um, after uh, the partition, and and it, that flow actually continued till the Bangladesh War, where after seventy one also people come came and lived, and. That's how those, uh, though, I mean, that part of the city has grown actually, living in, uh, mostly with these people. So you hear obviously uh, a lot of difference in the language that Kolkata, particularly the old Kolkata people speak and these people speak. So there is a difference in dialect. And also what is interesting is that's how it's it's not about it's not language obviously people will not forget their language in one generation or two gener i mean dialect in one or two generations it will continue maybe for a few more generations but also it's interesting that how how uh, all the 
all the all the rituals and all the all the ceremonies and all the habits i would say rather that they brought over here and it continued in a way it took a different kind of shape in a way and i could listen to everything sonically in uh, through through these uh, through through these uh, listening sessions and stuff and when we discuss also uh, with others that these listening sessions that made people understand that place in a very different way uh, uh, in a in a way that we actually never thought of that it is possible to understand in this this way and uh, i think uh, i i i just there's no point playing it right now i just don't want to play also but you can you can try uh, listen to it because also it's quite seductive this map i mean if you if you play uh, bec- also it has it is fun because you can hear anything uh, i mean from anywhere and also uh, you know in from interesting places i don't know there is normally one one here in the in the rainforest in australian rainforest and uh, today it's not there maybe that internet is down or something but uh you can uh, hear hear all sorts of things like really vivid um no, no, finishing so thank you so uh, it's like wildlife and also the the life daily life uh, the way people so this is this is one thing that i wanted to share with you about uh, the thoughts with the thoughts of ways of listening to spaces um yeah. Okay I think that's it that's all <laughs> Thank you There's a part in Delhi that where a lot of Afghan people live uh, and then so in the pandemic time and they had a community library there some people they built some of our friends and so they were doing a project and so i did um, obviously everything was happening online and i was doing a, a kind of small workshop with them in the beginning that how to record sound now obviously this is one challenge for us now it is that you don't i mean that 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 mysterious thing about recording has completely gone and it's everybody can record which is a good good thing i believe but and that also puts us uh, give throws us a very nice challenge that how as a sound recorder is you put yourself where you put yourself uh, but the thing is anyway it's about them not me so it's uh, so they were they said okay we do, i we know how to record okay okay fine and then i said yeah, this is how you have to upload the sound this and i know we have to upload the sound so <laughs> it was really nice and and the and and then what uh, i have noticed is it's interesting the the because they were all very little kids and then when i asked them to just go record and they came up with lot of interesting recording and lot of recording and those recordings were uh, mostly about uh, a very few recording that that i have heard about uh, listening to environments because this is one thing that i have noticed with i mean there is a significant different difference between uh, the idea of listening uh, which i noticed and that that when we they talked about uh, when they they spoke with the you know elders they spoke about mostly about their memory you know and it is very common that you know with with migration you basically what you bring you bring, bring memory that's all you bring and then they talked about their 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 homes their life over there the kind of sound they used to hear and all sorts of thing and these kids and uh, they actually because it's it's a it's how it changes the habit it's not a, because that some of them obviously also have you know they they were born, born there and they have grown up some people and then they came it's not like that they have come 20 years back or anything very new migration 
so but they were not talking about it they were mostly talking about you know stories and songs and uh, mm -hmm. that what what they want to be and that kind of stuff and so the idea of listening to them is not really listening to environment or kind of you know or uh, kind of be i mean obviously it's not the age to become nostalgic but i'm saying that it's it's a very different kind of association with with sound that 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 i noticed uh, this was one one i don't know i mean obviously it's not an answer to any any of this but this is what i think uh, this is what i wanted to mention about what when you think about uh, so uh, this this the, i mean it's changing i mean the, the way of listening as i think has changed even i mean obviously pandemic pandemic time it's made us to think about uh, differently about sound and other things but also with the generation with new generation and all with these private spaces uh, becoming a very in uh, you know very dominant spaces uh, it has changed quite a lot yeah okay that's right uh, thank you for your beautiful presentations. Uh, actually, I'm going back to our dear Uma, because there's a question that I continue to ask him and he never ever responds. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you both have talked about the resonance of space and early on, uh, so you're talking about, you know, the cave, talking back, all that sort of thing. Now, ever since I first met him, I asked him, well, okay, he has record, you know, the, the measurements. So I went, oh yeah, here are the measurements. How does it sound? Not a word, okay? And even here, uh, you know, we've had this whole, all these seminars, all these books, et cetera, et cetera. Total silence. You said yourself, yeah, he has some measurements. But since you've been to Rani Kumpa and Anupa, are, what does it sound like? And, you know, also Uma was saying that the way the cave is uh, carved out is a bit like Tunina Tampura. So, you know, there's some resonance sort of ideas. So f can you just let me know, like, does it sound? <laughs> so there's been total silence. <laughs> And uh, this was actually one of our challenges, I think, that um, how you uh, also, I think, I, it's, it's, it's that how you, how you record a space, let's say, like, because um, then I think I'm trying to come to this answer in a different, through a different route, basically, that how you listen, listen, uh, how you record a space, I mean, a space like, like these ancient uh, uh, caves and stuff. Obviously, one thing is that you, let's say, quote unquote, activate the space in a way that you make some sound uh, over there and then uh, record the space, speak or respond to it. And that that is one kind of recording you make. And Uma was doing the the basically a pure scientific part of that, that he was basically playing higher response uh, sweeps and tones and then recording it back and then measuring the difference you know and the original and, and the reflections and then uh, was uh, trying to understand the space uh, but this uh, this thing i mean this was also for us i mean we tried all sorts of things really and these these spaces obviously sound fabulous in some senses that you, and it's very interesting to discover that where it uh, sounds great and from from which perspective it's, and because you, since people say that these, these are all performance spaces, so obviously there are spots that where, where the performance used to be, performers used to be, you, you try to think, you try to figure out and and try to position yourself. So with microphones, we tried quite a lot that, that we place ourselves in different positions and try to record and got very, very interesting results that. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that where, I mean, in where's the sweet spot, like where the performance performer will stand and talk and then that sound will be better and from how far you can hear it all sorts of thing we tried so yeah it sounds sounds quite quite fabulous but but also it's a challenge i think always that how you record yeah. these spaces i think this is something like yesterday we had a seminar and one of the things we were talking about was how there are some ways in which um some aspects of sound or even of existence go beyond what is articulate like what one can articulate right so 
um, we were we were reading Robin Kimmerer's book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, and in a, a chapter, specifically she talks about the sound of life in terms of a mushroom growing. So in, in Anishinaabe um, language, it's papui, right? It, that's its moment of its life, of its springing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we realize is that there's so many sounds that we don't have the words for to describe yeah. what that exactly. sound is. Yeah. Because with Uma, we have this conversation all the time. And he's just like, no, but it's this decimal to this decimal. And, I, and we're like, but what is the <laughs> word? Like, what is the sound? And But there's no word. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no word for it, right? Exactly. And that is what is, I think, um, that that's what moves us beyond science, that yeah. actually moves us into a realm of understanding the world in a different way. Yeah. It actually opens science up in a way that doesn't, that we can't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can't. And the, there is a resonance. You can hear it, but how does one say, what is the word of that resonance? Oh, yeah, I like, mean the, the quality of the quality of sound you're talking about. Yeah, but that <laughs> also like, whoa, whoa. that Uzma's thing that I reminded me one one interesting thing because uh, that this project that we have been doing together and there are there are a group of people who are now trying to listen to the art that that they're putting you know transducers yeah. microphones inside. there inside art and there are very active soils in a like lot of noise. yeah. And yeah. and the kind of the kind of noise they make it's unbelievable. Yeah. Then and if you amplify it, yeah. it's it's quite something. We have absolutely no idea what it is, and it gives a, it exactly like you said that it gives science a completely new new you know new direction mm -hmm. that that where where I mean to understand this world that we thought that we know already about it, but we don't. And, and Uma really is a scientist, right? Like his whole thing is that he's you know. You know, there are also uh, sound artists who actually put those microphones that actually capture the sound of, you know, bell ringing when it's not ringing, but it is That's right. Ringing. That's right. So uh, if one could just share that, maybe, I mean, you know, yeah. you know and the echo, so that's one more question. But you, you've heard it, right? You just echo back, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, so the recordings aren't the recordings aren't part of this. The, uh, I some, they, some are. Some, some recordings. You should course. be able to hear it in the show. Yeah. Really? Oh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I've been I've been listening for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I think in the film of the of Temple Street, it might be something. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Question in the back. Oh, there's a question. I think she had her hand. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. No, I I was just gonna pick up from where you guys were talking about. Um, in, in, in fact, yeah, it's true that when we name things, somehow it just limits everything. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is to just get away from that, you know, and, uh, uh, and also it de depends on the, um, on the technology that we have because uh, sound technology, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's always evolving. So, you know, uh, these days we can record sounds amazingly that we would never have heard before so that is also evolving as well so and it's like scientists who look at the skies and the universe and using different rays to see invis light that's invisible to our eyes so all this is it's really interesting and it's it joins back to what you say yeah. uh, i'm just curious about the idea of you know the sound of the universe that the ancients <laughs> say mm -hmm. where they call it om mm -hmm. or al, you know that kind of thing. I mean, where, where did they hear that? Where did they get <laughs> this? The sound that of the universe. The I want to know. They didn't <laughs> have technology. <laughs> they didn't have. You know, where does it come from? Where does it come from? You know, when I was meditating in India, uh, a guru that says, "Well, it's the first sound that." A human being can make huh. using his uh, his uh, his tummy, and then bringing it up through the throat huh. all the way up. So, so it's energy mm, goes through, mm. and it, it lifts you up. Mm. So I'm just yeah. So I'm just curious if you guys had any. <laughs> the, it's this is outside my that. area of expertise. Um, so I'm happy to hand it over to you. <laughs> if you like to take I don't know where Om comes from. <laughs> Nobody knows. I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is it just me? <laughs> but the, also, the, also the question is, you have to understand that again. What I was talking about that the association with sound has completely changed over the years. What we have done to sound, first thing, that we have taken out, uh, taken 
out all the mysticism, all the around it, around sound, because sound otherwise is very ab abstract, right? And that is why it has got a lot of mystery in it inherently. But that that we have taken out. The science has because we are we understand we understand sound as a physical phenomenon nowadays, not as a voice from you know, not as ethereal voice in a sense. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I mean, obviously there is, I'm sure that there's, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm saying that, uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say that, that we don't know if it existed or people actually could hear it or not. We, we have no evidence or maybe sparse evidence, I don't know. But the point is that even it exists now, and I'm sure maybe it exists, but it's impossible to hear it. Mm. Maybe the new, like John Cage said, maybe it masked by the traffic, <laughs> or 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 it's we lost our capability in a sense. Mm. That's because we understand sound in a very very different way now. It's it's it's, it's uh, the mysticism is gone. I mean, spaces don't speak the way it used to speak. So space is also your body, and this space is something. The way you eat used to speak to you, don't speak to you nowadays in, in, in the way it used to. Maybe this is one way of thinking about it, I don't know. Mm. Thank you, thank you. You say mysticism, but the word I'm thinking of is enchantment. Yeah, thank you for this. Um, no, just the thinking or imagining about this idea of collecting sound um, or also archaeological practices like archaeology and touch and sound in relation to listening. And I think of it as like the end unit is kind of unified, like touch could be unified or universal or listening could be unified and universal. And it makes me think how much, um, like if someone is hypersensitive to sensorials, if someone is highly sensitive or what about the blind and how much this experience that is not linear of listening or touching is actually present in the results of how you or you are talking about this sound or how it, um, like the sounds from spaces are actually being talked about and shared. I don't know if I made sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, I think that, thank you for that question. I think it, this kind of, it's, it's a nice question to kind of wrap up on because it brings us back to our first question, right? Because this question of what happens when you are extra, when there's an extra sensorial versus if you are less, if you have less, right? This, this gradation, the scaling of sound and the ways in which one interacts with that, I think is really important. So thinking through, like, I think what, what I hear is probably not what Sukanta hears because I think I think that his hearing is here. My hearing is like very pedestrian in comparison, right? So it's like taste or it's like any of these other things. And it, it requires a certain kind of training. But at the same time, those who are of that place hear it and taste it and feel it in a way that is beyond even what b both of us might have, right? And so to really think about um, how sound also has a placeness to it may open up this this question in, into a different kind of way. Yeah, just just a potentially. I'm conscious of time. Yeah, yeah. Like of, to course. Take from of course, of course, of course. It's not a question, but a kind of you know. I think I just want to pick up where Uzma kind of left a little bit. Um, I missed the initial presentation, so sorry about that. But I think uh, when you spoke of two things, which kind of struck me. Uh, quite hard. One was uh, authenticity and this obsession to kind of, especially coming from the discipline of archaeology, to anchor something that um, specifies a historical trajectory and our romanticized understanding of the past. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is uh, about the simultaneity that you spoke about. I think the exhibition brilliantly disrupt the whole colonial discourse of the past, present, and the future kind of bringing everything together on the one single plane and then really kind of speaking from the past to the present itself within one dream. But what I wanted to basically check with you is about uh, the past comes with a specific epistemic violence, mm -hmm. which simply cannot be, uh, you know, ignored thinking about the, the romanticized version of the sound right. uh, or the listening to the past 
what I'm basically was worrying about and keep thinking about which I actually brought in yesterday's conversation, when, not yesterday, but when we had our uh, study of archaeology group that who are we listening to? Yeah. Uh, the question is that also um, uh, the kind of inclusion and exclusion of the sound that we want to listen to. Mm -hmm. So um, especially um, uh, the 30 years ago, the question was asked, can Subaltern speak? But I wonder, can Subaltern even listen? You know, mm -hmm. because um, that that really creates a, 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 you know, like I belong to a community who was not even allowed uh, to go near the temple or near the past, sure. like near the places that could basically listen to. So then who are we talking about here? Like, you know, right. So I think that the exhibition really tries to address that in a very different way where uh, when I think about uh, Padmini's work and mm -hmm. her placement of a camera on the ankle mm -hmm. allows that to listen to the body mm -hmm. through a certain specific perspective. So I think, anyway, I just want to kind of hear from you about like, what do you think about the epistemic violence of the past? Like, yeah, well, I mean, that's, that is precisely my project, right? I actually, um, all my work is, is directly deals with epistemic violence of the, of the past. And so what I, what I presented today was um, the ways in which the colonial past, as well as the hegemonic, there's a very hegemonic nation state-ness to these sites as well, right? So you have the colonial ceiling, you have the nation state that has a very particular kind of religious ideology that it's closing um, the site into. And what I'm trying to do, the one of the ways, I mean, there are many ways one can undo epistemic violence, but in this particular case, by going through the salt, and thinking about the salt and thinking about the relationship of the salt to the mud, the salt to the sand, the sand to the mud brick, the mud brick to the baked brick, and to the city, I am able to disrupt all the colonial narratives about the site of Mohenjo-daro, right? And I'm able to give the site a chance to speak for itself, right? So that I showed all of these reports from save, the safeguarding Mohenjo-daro, the UNESCO reports, this report, that report, all of the colonial men who came by, right? Uh, all the Hindu men who came by, Rakhal Das Banerjee and all of them, right? All of the Brahmins who came by. I showed all of them. And then I said, but this is on that side. Here is a different way in which one can actually come to the site. And that's precisely the project that needs to happen because we need to not only undo the colonial baggage, we need to undo the nation state baggage. We need to undo the hegemonic narratives that take hold over sites. And this is a huge issue right now in India and in Pakistan, right? These Indus sites are being used as a way to establish a very specific form of authority, a very specific form of uh, a claim to indigeneity that is not indigenous, right? And this is, it's, it, and it impacts contemporary politics, which is why these sites become so very important to undo and to disentangle. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question, or at least begins to address some I, of the project. Yeah. yeah, I think you, you know, um, you definitely did, but I think, you know, with this, uh, thank you for mentioning this whole, uh, um, focused on nation state. And I think the whole losing of Indus to Pakistan made like made like this mad rush uh, towards finding the biggest site and then claiming Rakhi oh yeah, Gari. As yeah. like, oh, I we have a bigger them. site than you and we have mm -hmm. Lothal. So to kind of talk about Lothal's that. Lothal's a very charming site, though. I have <laughs> uh, to say, I like it. But coming, <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, <laughs> but coming from that uh, thing, but also then, then uh, this whole rush towards um, with, uh, I'm sorry, I'm being very specific, but Bibi Lal is trying to find the whole yeah. Ramayan yeah. in Mahabharat sites, yeah. going mad over it. Uh, and then the whole that narrative that gets built up in the 90s to speak very hist very uh, a very right-wing specific mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. of the past. And, and they changed the textbooks. Very much, yeah. They changed so, all, and sort of changed all the textbooks. So, as, so what I yeah. meant by epistemic wall is definitely with echoing with you. Yeah, it's yeah. not purely the colonial narrative that, that anyway comes in, yeah. but also the not... But it comes in on the heels of. Very right? much, what, yeah. what gives it the opportunity to have that kind of hole is precisely mm -hmm. the ways in which the colonial has set up this notion of secular science. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's the hold. That's the hold that we have to kind of undo to, to get to a different kind of narrative. So I appreciate your question. Thank you. You want to talk about RSS? Come on, get in with us. Let's all talk about it. No. Well, oh yeah, yeah, we might have to edit this out just to like put this in there, this, this last bit. 
what's happening in India is no joke. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, um, no, what, what, I mean, this is, this is, uh, thank you very much for bringing this up, actually, because this, this is, this is what I think also we were uh, thinking uh, very strongly when we we're trying to conceptualize this project and that, because, you know, it's very difficult to bring ourselves out from this whole idea. I mean, how do you, uh, as a listener, as a keen listener, how, how do you bring yourself out from, from the idea of colonization of, in all all the i mean the the ideas of listening that has already been given to us and the ideas of recording that already i mean all the recording devices think about that so uh, it's it's i mean one way i mean i one way for me it's it's subverting really so you subvert your listening you subvert your process of recording in a, in a sense like I give you a very small example, and that's it for me because uh, the the project that I was showing at the at the uh, at the end, that uh, that uh, streaming project, so people come up with a lot of uh, uh, ideas of that how you with let's say with equipment that what kind of equipment you use and and equipment has something to something you know, directly has something to do with economy and market and, you know, hence, uh, I mean, idea of colonization in a way. But the thing is, so what, what I try to do over here uh, in, in, in this case that I like kind of build very cheap things against it. Like, so because this, there is this very uh, idea that when you listen, you have to like listen to good sound. Mm -hmm. Like sound has to be recorded like really with really nice microphones, with uh, with in a very nice studio spread and all sorts of things. And how you deal with this idea of listening to good sound? Mm -hmm. And what is good sound? Who will tell us that what is good sound? Do we on an everyday basis? Do we really li listen to good sounds? I mean. When we are when we are walking in the street and talking to a friend and really enjoying that talk, hence the sound. I mean, is it clear? I mean, sometimes we are not even listening to them properly and I say, well, "What are you saying? What are you saying?" But we are we are trying to, you know. So why not bring that into your work? And I think that that is what I would do. I mean, or I do try to do, like in because in film, film is. Film is something. It's totally. It's it's bad. It's hierarchical. It's it's like it's it's you you can't imagine the kind of <laughs> place it is. I mean, the kind of space it has created for us, and the, I mean, talking about working space. And then you you have all this gadget equipment and all, and then good sound. Idea of good sound. So against that, we build. I mean, I what I do is I I build very cheap microphones like really, really cheap stuff, like literally 10 rupees a mic, literally. And then, which gives me a interesting freedom because when I'm not buying a microphone which cost two lakh rupees, uh, Indian rupees, then it doesn't break my heart also. I mean, in a, in, in a very good way that if something happens to it, and that gives a very interesting freedom. I tell you what, just one example, that there was this cyclone uh, two years back in Kolkata, in the middle of lockdown, it's called Amphal. And it, it actually destroyed the city in a very nice way. <laughs> like all the, anyway, there is no tree, but some old trees has, I mean, it's gone and a lot of trees destroyed. The thing is when, what I did is I was trying to listen to that cyclone rising and going over the city and dying. Mm. And I put up a microphone on my roof, those 10 rupee stuff, obviously. And then uh, I was listening to it. And at one point when it was really passing with full force, it broke my mic, obviously. It just took it away with it. Mm. and. I have that sound also I, because I was also recording at the same time. So it was growing, 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 and suddenly nothing, and it's broke. 
but the thing is see this is what happens like these give me i think a kind of very interesting way of listening and like also freedom also an economic freedom and a kind of you know access also if you think about it so this access is very important i think that so if you think about also colonization and stuff like that 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 gave me very interesting access like when you are saying that can be uh, can subaltern listen mm -hmm. like this access is important uh, that what to listen to and when to listen to and how to listen to all this access is very important you have to also talk about that mm -hmm. i mean so i think I don't know if it's answer, but I think this is my thought on the sound recording stage. Thank you so much. I know we can continue. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, I do hope that the resonances of this project continue on. Um, you know, uh, I know that there is a small group uh, that hopes to continue to meet more regularly. Uh, but I also wanted to say, and this is a shout out to Lawrence, who's not here, he's traveling, that um, there is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, attention to listening that is happening in, in the space. Uh, and his show continues to be on at the Sharjah Art Foundation. So do go and see that. And I think that, you know, has a very different relationship in a way to what we've been doing here. And I think... It's been interesting to have projects that are so distinct in their approach to the field. Um, but thank you both. I think this kind of idea of field work was really kind of important um, to us understanding the project a bit better. So thanks a lot and thank you for, thank you for listening. <laughs>